Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. To everyone on Zoom and also to everyone who is here with us in person today, I'm very glad that you are here. I can say that I am especially glad to be back with you all again in worship. I have truly missed being with you all while I've been away on paternity leave. But with that, I'll also say that I've been very grateful for the opportunity that I've had to be more present with Emily and our little Lily Jane, who is five weeks old as of today, and I believe that they are en route um, to worship as we speak. So she may be making an appearance. You know, these things are, are a little fragile um, <laughs> as they go. We'll see. So now, everyone, with joy in our hearts, let us join together in our call to worship. We'll use the printed liturgy, as can be found in your bulletin. I will read the non-bolded portions, and we will all read together the bolded portions. Easter people, we have been saved by the risen Christ, the life-giving vine. We abide in love, the life-giving vine. We are branches of the vine, sustained, nurtured, and pruned by love. We have no life apart from love, the life-giving vine. When we make our home in the vine, and the vine makes a home in us, we bear the fruit of love. We will love and learn to love as we rest, play, work, and build community with God and one another. Amen. Let us pray. God of love, as we gather today to worship you, we ask that you plant us in the soil of your grace. Nurture us with the strength of Christ, the vine of everlasting life. Enlighten us with the wisdom of your spirit, which flows through us today and all days. Abide in us that we may abide in you and live in your love. In your holy name we pray, amen. <laughs>
Our first reading today is Psalm 22, verses 25 to 31. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. At this time, I invite us to stand as you are able for our prayer of confession and affirmation. Let us pray. Merciful one, you know when we are afraid to love. You know when we are too cowardly to show mercy. Remind us again that perfect love casts out such fears. Surround us and strengthen us with your perfect love, even in the face of our imperfections. Imbue us with a love so strong, with such growth toward perfection, that we may cast aside our pride and embrace the power of love. Be assured of God's love for you and for the world this day and forevermore. By God's grace, we are made whole. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, may we live patiently with one another, walking in the love of Christ as Christ loves us. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to greet one another with signs of peace.
Our second reading comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, and can be found on page 991 in the Pew Bible. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loves us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us.
Friends, as our ushers begin to come forward for our time of giving this morning, let us remember two opportunities to give. One for our spring offering, which is continuing and which benefits Together for Hope Louisiana, which you can read about in your bulletin. We will collect for this offering through Sunday, May 19th, Pentecost Sunday. I think that's right. And also remember our new Community Meals initiative, which I heard got off to a wonderful start yesterday and was very successful. And remember that if you would like to donate financially to contribute toward the food or the meals, you can earmark your electronic giving or a paper check to that end. And so now with a grateful heart for all that God has given us, let us give back so that we might be a blessing to others. Amen. Indulge me for just a moment, but I do want to say that Emily and Lily were able to arrive in case, and I say that only in case they have to make a disappearance at some point. I don't, you know, I'm so proud and I want her to be glimpsed at least uh, in this moment. So now as we come to our time of prayer, uh, let us first keep a brief silence, which we do, a time to sort of sink down and to settle into ourselves and into our hearts a bit. May we be mindful of our own joys and concerns and of the concerns of our neighbors and of our world. 
This morning, I'll lead us through a series of petitions and following each one, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you all will say back, hear our prayer. Again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you all will say, hear our prayer. And after these petitions, we'll pray together the Lord's Prayer. So confident of God's presence in our midst, let us center our hearts around the one who abides eternally with us. Let us pray. O oh Lord, today for the earth and for its healing, for fields and crops, for rivers and lakes, and for the blooming and buzzing and blossoming spring that is in our midst, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, for political leaders, local and far away, for all of those who have experienced great injustice or tragedy, for those who work to make life better, to bring an end to war, and for those who give much for the sake of others, expecting little in return. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, for those who are sick, for those who struggle with addiction, for those who experience chronic pain, for those who provide care for the unwell and for the dying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, for those today who are lonely, for those who seek forgiveness, for those who feel trapped by a situation in life, for those who may wonder if they are worthy of love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, for precious and crying new life coming into the world, for honorable long lives which are nearing their end, for the promise of your abiding presence no matter what the passing of time may bring. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, for our loved ones and dear friends, for those whom we find hard to love, for those who are near and for those who are far away, for those whom we especially have on our hearts right now, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, for the delight of food and drink, for music and films, for art and beauty, for good health and companionship, for warm places to sleep, for another day in which we might rest or work for good in your beautiful world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And with these prayers in our hearts and for all that we have on our mind, we let these things rest in you, O oh God. And in this deep peace, we pray together in one accord the prayer that Christ taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our third reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. If you would like to follow along in your pew Bible, it can be found on page 878. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be holy, acceptable, and transformative in your sight. For, Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In these last few weeks following Easter Sunday, we have covered a great deal of ground. We have been asking ourselves the question of, now what? In a sense, as we've explored the call to be an Easter people, now what? Now that this great miracle has happened and our Lord has risen from the dead, how does that change how we live? To seek answers to that question, we have worked our way through the epistle of 1 John, admittedly much to my chagrin, and have explored how the author of this letter calls us to live and order our lives in response to the resurrection of Jesus. First, we examined the call to walk in the light. We do this by discerning where God's light is leading us and following faithfully in it. Along the journey, of course, there will be shortcomings and sin that God's light in Christ makes known to us. And while we may be tempted to think that our shortcomings disqualify us from being faithful sojourners, the real sin here is not being honest and authentic about our failings. By being honest about our faults, we have more authenticity with ourselves, our community, and with God, which then invites us to examine corporate shortcomings within our community. We bear the same call to be honest about those communal shortcomings, taking responsibility for messing it all up sometimes, and discerning with intention how we're going to move forward together following God's light that's been revealed to us. Next, we examined the call to be purified in hope. We looked closely at the extremely uncomfortable passage in 1 John that was just drenched in sin and shame language. We acknowledged that it was just complicated enough to want to ignore it and look closely at anything else. Or maybe that was just me, who could say? But we embraced the challenge that to ignore it would pose an even greater risk to the practice of our faith. After all, the process of purification is not meant to be a comfortable one. We learned that to ignore the severity of this sin talk would make us willingly blind to the reality that we are in fact culpable in systems of injustice and oppression that Jesus came to dismantle. That nothing can be changed or transformed unless we're honest about the part we play in it. But we also learned that there is more love and grace available to us than we could ever fathom. And to ignore the sin talk completely diminishes the immense gift that is God's grace. 
By being faithful to wade through the discomfort, we open ourselves and our communities up to great transformation for the sake of the world. And last week, we examined the call to love one another, a command that sounds so simple in its nature, but that is far more complicated than we like to admit. We explored the reality that love is not defined by our feelings or our emotions as it is often depicted in traditional culture. Yes, love certainly can be emotion driven, but love must also be shown in our actions. Love demands that we walk the talk as it were. But we must always remember where our loving actions are to be rooted, remembering that love comes from God and that our actions must be born from that central place of holy and divine love and grace. This leads us to the next big question that we must ask of ourselves. How do we do that? How do we love? What does it look like? How can we recognize it with our senses? How can we know if we're doing it right? How on earth does God call us to love? To love our family, our friends, our communities, our enemies, or even ourselves. The Gospel of John answers this question in our passage for this morning. We love the way that God calls us to love by bearing fruit. Now, admittedly, in Christian communities, this language has become fairly common, especially if you, like me, grew up as a child singing some vacation Bible school song about the fruits of the Spirit. In a similar way, this symbolism and this use of agricultural metaphor would have been familiar to the hearers at the time because vineyard symbolism abounds throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Even in the apocryphal text of Sirach, wisdom compares herself to a vine that blossoms with beauty. And in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 5, the house of Israel and the people of Judah are identified as the vineyard of the Lord, while God is the gardener. In Isaiah, the image that he paints in the scripture is one of very scattered hopes for God's people, as Isaiah declares My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded rotten grapes. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield rotten grapes? fruit. The frustration is very clear in Isaiah, as this vineyard had everything it needed to yield this abundant crop, and yet all the gardener got were rotten grapes. The final verse of this passage translates the metaphor saying, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his cherished garden. God expected justice but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Israel's failure to live a life of justice and righteousness and instead practicing a life of corruption and bloodshed is expressed through this agricultural metaphor of yielding fruit. And thus God's punishment and judgment is expressed through pruning and clearing away branches. The imagery in our text in the Gospel of John is very similar to this, and the expectations of the gardener seem to remain consistent with the call placed in Isaiah for justice and righteousness. Yet I would argue that there is an additional expectation of love found in our Gospel passage. After all, that is the question we're attempting to ask here, to answer here, isn't it? How shall we love Our text tells us that the fruit we bear, the actions that we take to live justice and to live righteousness, that those things are works of love, acts of love. To do works of love such as this, they are the tangible sign of discipleship. 
Now, while this language and symbolism of agriculture and bearing fruit and vines and branches might have been familiar to first century Christians, and perhaps might be familiar to those of us in this room who have a green thumb, or maybe if you're lucky enough to, I would argue that it's not intimately familiar to all of us, myself included. So I did a bit of digging, pun intended, to understand more deeply how we can connect to this metaphor, specifically around this symbolism of pruning and clearing branches. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned with you in my sermon that um, Mary Catherine and I committed ourselves to yard work. And some of that yard work involved pruning our crepe myrtle trees. Now, I have to be honest that I was very hesitant to do this because when I was in elementary school, once upon a time, I got a hold of our pruning loppers in the height of summer and I was playing outside and my imagination got the best of me. And I thought that the branches on our crepe myrtle trees would be perfect to make like a wooden raft or a fort or something that I had no business trying to create. Needless to say, once the damage had been done and our crepe myrtle trees were irreversibly eviscerated, I got in a good bit of trouble <laughs> and learned that cutting back crepe myrtle branches was risky business. So for this round of it, I wanted to make sure I was doing it right. I looked up article after article about how best to prune these branches, and in it, I found a wealth of different advice, as you might imagine. So many factors have to be taken into account, like what season is it? How tangled are the branches? Which branches were dead? And where did the branch death start? And could you cut it back to a healthier point and try to salvage it for regrowth? which branches were healthy, but growing too many offshoots to be healthy for the tree as a whole. There was a lot to consider in doing this one task. And there were also a lot of different methods for approaching how to do it. I did some similar homework with this week, uh, with this passage, and found that the same can be said of pruning grapevines. Many factors contribute to the how and the why and the when a gardener will prune the branches from a vine. Things such as the content of the soil, the region of the world in which the vines are growing, the environment, the weather, the type of grape variety that they're attempting to grow, and so on and so forth. But the most consistent reminder in all of my research was that of the value of pruning. The purpose is always to bear more healthy fruit. Up to this point, we've seen pruning described as this act of judgment and punishment in our biblical texts. And depending on how often or regularly we do or do not prune our plants or trees, it can very much be seen as punishment, something that has to be done because things have gotten out of hand. In fairness, that's the only reason we got out there with loppers in the first place. Our garden had gotten out of control. So branches upon branches had to go so that we could salvage the health of our trees. My neighbor even asked, is there any yard left back there? There is. <laughs> but the interesting part of it is that if pruning is done right, we ought to be doing it a lot more regularly and frequently so that we can have healthy growth. Pruning doesn't always have to be a punishment. It can simply be a discipline. Let's look back at this gospel text. Jesus says that he is the vine and God is the vine grower, the gardener, the vintner, whichever way you want to look at it. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, which means that we are the ones expected to bear fruit. And Jesus goes on to say that God removes the branches that don't bear fruit. He cuts them and throws them away to wither and eventually be thrown in a fire and burned. But the dead and fruitless branches are not the only branches being pruned. Verse 2 reads, He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit, yes. But he goes on to say this, You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. In the Greek, the word cleansed, 
that, we, that translates as cleansed is the same Greek word used to describe pruning. So Jesus is saying that we have already, already received some initial pruning by being welcomed into the fold of God. But how do we continue to grow? How do we let our pruning take hold and produce something bountiful and nourishing for the world? How do we make sure that our freshly pruned branches don't succumb to pests and disease? Jesus answers this question in the next verse. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. The call that Jesus extends to us to abide in him is deeply relational language. Being connected richly to the vine means that we obtain nourishment from the vine. The water that courses through the vine extends to us. The vine may remain stationary, but we as the branches get to be extensions of it, stretching out and bearing fruit for the world. At the risk of sounding like a trite evangelical, John is claiming that by maintaining a relationship with Jesus, the vine, then we will bear fruit as the branches. John is claiming that Jesus grants us access to God in ways that were never before possible. This makes sense for the Gospel of John. It's a gospel that is filled with very high Christology, emphasizing Christ's divinity more than his humanity or than any of the other three gospels tend to do. And upon a first read, this lofty language can certainly make us feel a bit distant from the divine, which is why it's so important to note that John uses this language of relationship to show us that God is accessible to us and that becoming like God can in fact happen if we emulate Christ. Now we may not totally understand the agricultural metaphors, but perhaps we can understand the relational ones. How do we invest in our relationships? How do we walk the talk of love as we are being asked to do? This often comes up as a question for couples and marriages. How are you investing in your relationship? Now, Mary Catherine alluded to this last week in her exploration of how we understand what love is, that we, like many in the world, are fans of Taylor Swift. And immediately upon her album's debut, we listened to it, and it is quite an exploration on the messiest of human emotions, I must say. In several songs, she waxes lyrically about what it's like to be clinging with desperation to a relationship that is wholly one-sided. In her song, So Long London, she writes these lines. And my friends said it isn't right to be scared every day of a love affair. Every breath feels like rarest air when you're not sure if he wants to be there. And she goes on to write, you swore that you loved me, but where were the clues? I died on the altar waiting for the proof. Ouch, just ouch. She describes so painfully and poetically the experience of being in a relationship with someone that she would give and had given everything for, for whom she has waited achingly for a myriad of ways, and yet at the end of each day, she doesn't even really know if he wants to be with her. He says and swears that he loves her, and yet she has to ask, where are the clues? How are you trying to show me that you actually mean that? Now, this doesn't have to apply strictly to romantic relationships. Think about our friendships in live that have just fizzled out due to distance or circumstances or significant life changes. 
We may long to be close to them again, but we've been apart for so long that we don't really know each other anymore. We know each other as we used to be, but for good and bad, better or worse, we change as people in this life. And if we don't remain and abide in one another's lives, then that connection gets weakened and can be lost. I know I've personally had experiences in my life where friends with whom I've lost touch, maybe because of the mutual busyness of life, or maybe worse than that, a circumstance that keeps us from further investing in each other's lives, will reach out to me, either making an attempt to catch up or maybe even asking me for something, and it feels strange and foreign, maybe even a little icky and slimy, because we don't know each other anymore. We're not friends. <laughs> I don't know them, they don't know me, they know who I used to be, a version of me that they have in their mind, but they don't actually know who I am or what I'm like or what I want and what I need. I say all of this and wax about Taylor Swift and about branches and fruit and vines because abiding in relationship is crucial to keeping them intact. And if it's crucial in our relationships with other human beings, it is absolutely vital in our relationship to God through Christ. Abiding in the vine or abiding in Christ will mean that we have to face the discipline of pruning, yes. As it translates to relationships, we will have to make sacrifices. We may even have to sacrifice good things in order to produce greater and healthier things. So how might this translate to our community of faith? What things might we need to sacrifice or cut back in order to produce something good and healthy? Are we bearing fruit in the right spirit, the spirit of God's love for us, or is it in the spirit of control or keeping up appearances? I'll offer a final image for us to take with us. There's a legendary story in the town of Fort Walton Beach, Florida, where my wife's family still lives. The story goes that Mary was a chainsaw. Now before anyone gets concerned, she did have her reasons. She's a gardener through and through, and she spends many days and hours taking care of her flowers and her plants in and around her yard. And in Florida, when the heavy winds come, as it, they often do, and topple down trees or large branches, the only real thing to do is bring out the chainsaw to cut it into some more manageable pieces. So while most people in Fort Walton Beach probably didn't get it, my mother-in-law to this day talks about how she was tickled pink that she was gifted a chainsaw for Mother's Day because it was practical. That's the kind of person she is. She's frugal, she's practical. She wants something she can use. It was what she wanted. It was reflective of what she desired. If I may stretch the metaphor, that is how God calls us to love. To bear fruit, yes, but not sour fruit, not fruit born from our expectations or spirit, not fruit born of the unjust vineyard in Isaiah, not fruit that reeks of bloodshed and corruption, but fruit that reflects justice, goodness, liberation, love, and grace. We're called to love by abiding in the vine and communing with the vine, learning what it is the vine wants from us as the branches and bearing fruit that says way more about who God is than who we are. It is by doing this, by sacrificing our own wants and desires that we extend love to the world. 
so that others might taste and see that the Lord is good, that they might taste and see that God is love, and that might they might taste and see that God longs to build relationship with them just as God has with us. So friends, may we abide in God's love. May we be nourished by it. May we be strengthened by it. May we not be afraid of being pruned by it. And may we bear fruit that is plentiful, abundant, and reflective of it. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Everyone, again, thank you for, for being here this morning. It is delightful to see you. Taylor, um, I would say that my um, familiarity with Taylor Swift is not as great as yours. So I am grateful that she has made an appearance here this morning. I don't know that I would be, I would not have the same facility to incorporate her into sermon, but I'm glad we had that today. Um, couple of things to announce as we move forward um, into our week. One, I, as I mentioned during our call to give, I want to say thank you again 
um, and that I'm excited about the food ministry that Linda Easterlin and Pamela Ellers and Rowan Marie and others um, have undertaken and initiated and got off the ground yesterday. Uh, I heard that we had many volunteers and many people stopping by to enjoy that meal. And I think that this is good and important work. And so I'm glad to see it continue to take off and grow from here. Please keep in mind also that in about two and a half weeks or so, we will continue what has been our practice now since last October of having a third Wednesday night potluck supper. Um, and so we took the month of April off, but that's the first one we've taken off since October. But we will resume that potluck meal again. That would be Wednesday, May the 15th. So we've got a few weeks to go. But think third Wednesday nights so when you think of that. We'll continue that going forward um, and through the summer as well. Um, also, I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up today. It's nothing bad. But um, the sermon inspired me to go ahead and to mention it um, about abiding in Christ. Um, something over the years that has been very meaningful to me has been the practice. Um, if you have familiarity with the Episcopal Church or the Catholic Church, this might be more familiar to you. But the practice of common prayer um, and in those traditions, there's often uh, morning prayer, noon prayer, evening prayer, things like that. Um, the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer has those orders of service lined out. And so I have, um, I have put together some material um, over these past several weeks. And I think that I don't have a, the exact schedule worked out yet. I want to make it workable um, for this new stage of life. But, um, but to have a resource where we can have scattered throughout the week and, and even on Wednesday nights um, when fitting and when appropriate um, to do uh, something akin to that. So for some of you that may be familiar, for some of you that may not be familiar, but over, over the course of May, we'll start to figure out what that might look like for us. But the purpose again would be to have some sort of contemplative Vespers-like, even song-like uh, practice where we can gather together for those who want to and for those who are able to, to sort of come and plug in and to have a short time, maybe 20 minutes or so, a time of prayer together uh, and a resource that guides us through that. That has been something that's helped me connect. Um, and so if that is something that may speak to you or that may you may be able to do, um, we'll, we'll continue the conversation and go from there uh, as time goes forward. So just know that that is in the works and something else that will be coming down the line. Now, lastly, I want to invite Taylor and Mary Catherine, uh, if you both would come and join me here at the front. Sorry, Mary Catherine, but I am gonna ask you to do that. Taylor, you're already up here. Yeah. I have to, we have to awkwardly do this. I have to speak into the microphone so folks at home uh, on Zoom can hear. But I wanted to formally and with all the warmth in my heart, thank you both for all of the time and the energy that you have spent. It takes a lot of work to have these services come together. And for me to be able to be home with my baby has been a tremendous gift. And also to know that I love this congregation and I so deeply value the warmth and the love and the thoughtfulness of our services, the intellectual nature of our services, the, the moral undertones that bind us together as a community of faith and to know that Mary Catherine and Taylor, I never had a single doubt, of course, that any of that uh, would, would, would not maintain and continue to be vibrant and to look around and to see how many people are here today only speaks to that fact. Um, so thank you all both. We have a gift on behalf of the church um, and me to the two of you. Um, thank you all. I love you all. We appreciate you all. That is all I have. My prediction was correct. Miss Lily decided that she had to disappear and go somewhere else. <laughs> but I don't know where she might be, but she might be around. We'll shall see. Taylor, if you would come and uh, pronounce the benediction. Branches of the vine, go from this place blessed by love to work in love with your family, your friends, your neighbors, and strangers who will become friends, bearing the fruit of the life-giving vine as you cultivate abundant life wherever you go. Amen. <laughs>